We're still in 1 Samuel chapter 30, and we have looked last Lord's Day on David and his men. Tonight we want to look at David and the people. Let's begin reading with verse number 1 of chapter 30 of 1 Samuel. <clears throat> and I wonder if you would mind helping me out uh, by reading a series of four words when I stop. And I'm not doing this just to, uh, I hope it doesn't aggravate you, but, but I want to impress on you something that we are going to try to bring forth tonight. So when I stop, can you read me four words? And it came to pass when Amen. we're come to Ziklag on the third day that the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziklag and smitten Ziklag and burned it with fire and had taken the women captives that were therein. They slew not any, either great or small, but carried them away and went on their way. So Amen. came to the city and behold, it was burned with fire. And their wives and their sons and their daughters were taken captives. Then, they the hmm, changed a little bit, didn't it? That were with him lifted up their voice and wept until they had no more power to weep. And David's two wives were taken captives. Ahinaam the Jezreelitess and Abigail the wife of Nabal the Carmelite. Uh-oh. You just get three words this time. And David was greatly distressed, the spake of stoning him, because the soul of three words the was grieved, every man for his sons and for his daughters. But David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. We begin to notice that the wording changes. And as we are looking for the Lord Jesus Christ in this, and not looking for a history lesson of the culture of Israel or trying to find out the life and times of David the king. We, according to Christ's instructions to us in Luke 24, are searching the scriptures to find him, for he is that, he is the one that uh, edifies us as we seek him out to be our bread and to be our sustenance. So we want to take notice. It says David and his men in verse number one and also in verse number three. But then we see in verse number four, the verse starts off with then. That speaks of a when. That speaks of a happening that has taken place, and now things are going to be different. David and his men came to the city. It was burned with fire. Now it says in verse 4, then, and it changes to David and the people. So when tragedy strikes, that's what we call it, when adversity strikes, when trials overtake us, when you've been out in the wilderness not having a place to dwell, you anchor yourself with this man, you know he's a man of God, and he anchors himself with a Philistine king. And you begin to get put out by the Philistines. And Achish tells David to go at the first light and separate, him, separate himself from the Philistines, so the Philistines don't even want him around anymore. But that's okay. In 1 Samuel 27 and verse 6, it says that the city of Ziklag had been given to David, and it still belongs to the king of Israel, it said, to the day of this writing. So, okay, a lot of problems, but we're all right. We're still following David, and we're going back to Ziklag, my wife will have my favorite meal for me and my kids will be there and they'll run out and holler daddy and jump up in my arms and everything will be great. But the word then is written. 
And it changes from David and his men to David and the people. We can see this in the disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. They prided themselves and were thankful to be able to be so, disciples of the one that they knew to be the eternal Son of God. They were following him around and doing good. Yes, the Jews threw them out. Nobody having anything to do with uh, the Jewish hierarchy wanted anything to do with them. But that was okay. They were following Jesus and everything was going fine. They were his men. Then, he submits himself to the cross of Calvary. And they're no longer seen as the group of disciples surrounding the person of Christ, but every man went to his own house. One betrayed him, one denied him. Only one stayed with the women and went to the cross with him. Everything changed. You can be one of God's elect and be one of God's men, one of God's disciples, but there's going to come a bump in the road. And it is going to try you to your very core. After this, you will look at everything differently. You will have to be like Peter. The rest of his life, he had to contemplate himself being the one written in the scriptures. It was written down. Peter was the one that denied him three times. Rooster told on him. And you'll have to know that, you know, God didn't save me because I was one of his buddies. He saved me when I was yet an enemy of God. When I saw that everything in my life was ruined because of him. And the Lord was faithful to me anyhow. It's an amazing thing. So it changes from David and his men to David and the people. And as you will imagine, these are two entirely different Hebrew words. Jesus wept, John 11. John 11, verse 32. John eleven thirty two. Then when Mary was come where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying unto him, Lord, if thou hast been here, my brother had not died. We're disappointed in you. The Bible said in verse 6 of this chapter, when Christ heard that therefore that Lazarus was sick, he abode two days still in the same place where he was. If thou hast been here disappointed in God we have been that house where you have been pleased to come and stop by and me and my brother Lazarus and our sister we have been pleased to entertain you you have been comfortable with us and then when we needed you you stubbornly sat where you were for two days and you told your disciples Lazarus is dead it would do well if Lazarus was just asleep, but our friend Lazarus is dead. Verse 13 of chapter 11. So Mary faults Christ lovingly, but really is kind of put off with him, separated from him. Like the followers of David, they were once his men, but now they're just the people. Verse 33, John 11. When Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and as it were, saw also the Jews weeping, 
which came with her, he groaned in the spirit and troubled himself. And he said, where have you laid him? I've got to get past all of this sympathy. I've got to get past of all this self-pity. I've got to get past of all this inordinate affection. I've got to get on and get to doing what I know that God sent me to do. I needed a dead man to reveal salvation. That salvation is not healing a sick man. Salvation is the resurrection from the dead of one who is dead in trespasses and sins. And nobody but Jesus Christ can do that. If you were just sick, you may not be saved. Because you don't need a tonic. You weren't just naked and need a suit of clothes. You were plumb dead and you needed life and nobody could give it to you because everything and everybody around you was dead too. So the Lord Jesus groans in his spirit and he troubles himself and he said, where have you laid him? Let's get on with this. And then in verse 35, when they say, Lord, come and see, Jesus wept. There was a different kind of weeping with David than there was with the men. Because in 1 Samuel chapter 30, the scriptures said in verse 6, David was greatly distressed for the people spake of stoning him. Why? Because the soul of all the people was grieved every man for his sons and for his daughters. And then it says, But David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. Everybody held David responsible for what had happened. And they were wondering, Why did we follow you? What have you brought us to? Look what's happened to us because of you. They were distressed, but David was greatly distressed. That's what you have in John eleven thirty five. Jesus wept. He didn't weep like they were weeping. John eleven four. What does it say? When Jesus heard that, he said, "This sickness is not unto death." They were weeping because Lazarus was dead. Jesus was weeping because they didn't believe that he was the resurrection. You messed up, David. You messed up, Jesus. If you'd have been here, we believe you have the power to heal the sick. But we don't understand the fullness of depravity and know that the sinner is not just sick and needs a tonic. He is dead. And somebody with the power of life has got to come and resurrect him. That's why Jesus wept. He wasn't weeping because Lazarus was dead. In verse 4 it says, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified thereby. It says in verse 6, When he heard that he was sick, He waits two days till in the same place where he was so that Lazarus could get plumb dead. In verse 15, it says, I am glad for your sakes that I was not there. What? Yeah. Jesus wasn't weeping for the same reason that they were weeping. It's true that the Bible said when he saw her weeping and saw the Jews weeping, And heard her say in front of the Jews. As if she. Though not meant to. Was mocking her savior in front of these unbelievers. If you'd have been here my brother wouldn't have died. Jesus wept over the unbelief. Of those that he came. To seek and to save. Verse 36, the misconception of inordinate affections. 
Then said the Jews, Behold how he loved him. Oh, he's dead. Oh, look at him weep. He must have really loved him. Folks, I found out in a lot of years of funerals, the tears at a funeral are not always telling as, as far as being accurate as to why they're being cried. I've seen folks that they had to pull out of the casket, bellowing and hollering and carrying on, and the, the, uh, the funeral directors had to come up there and pull them out of the casket, and it wasn't because they loved them. It was because they regretted what they had done to the person and wished that there was some way they could reverse it, but it's too late. Oh, look how he loved him. He cried. That ain't why Jesus was crying. He knew he was going to die. He needed him to die. He waited two more days so he would die. And some said of him, verse 37 of chapter 11 of John, Could not this man which opened the eyes of the blind have caused that even this man should not have died? Jesus, therefore, because of that saying again, Jesus, therefore, again groaning. Why did he groan in verse 33? Because Mary said, If thou hast been here, my brother had not died. He groans. Then in verse 37, some of those that stood by them said, This man that opened up the eyes of the blind could have caused that even this man should not have died. They did not understand. They did not perceive. The man was required to be dead. People can't see it. I just want you to come and talk to my son and help him get out of this alcoholism. I just want you to come and talk to my daughter and try to get her head turned from this no account boyfriend of hers. I just want you to... No! You need the Lord Jesus to come in the power of the Holy Ghost and save them eternally and change them from daylight to dark. Amen. It's only if a man be in Christ is he a new creature. Here is the Son of God with heavenly intent. I am the way, the truth, and the life. They have, here they have the life-giving God. Standing with him, and all they want is a doctor. No wonder he wept. He came to his own. His own received him not. Jesus, therefore, again, groaning in himself, cometh to the grave. It was a cave, and a stone lay on it. Jesus says in verse number 40, Said I not unto thee that if thou wouldest believe, thou should see. What did she want to see? Her brother alive. What did he want her to see? The glory of God. Oh, we just want a little old, you know, church over here. I'm going to name it after my grandpa, you know, Jones Chapel Baptist Church. We're just going to, you know, we've got a big old hall downstairs and we, we can have our weddings and our socials and our good times and all kinds of things down there. And it's just, we just get together and we'll just pray for one another that, you know, when, when somebody breaks their arm, God will give them comfort. And if somebody gets the measles, we'll pray and ask God to. No, friend. You've got the very life of God walking among you. You're shooting too low. You're aiming too low. You need to go get up there in the presence of God and his glory where he dwells and say, do that which nobody else can do. Change them. Make all things new. We don't need a fixer-upper. We need a resurrector. David was greatly distressed. The whole load rested on him. All the men despised him. It was his fault. 
And the whole load rested on Jesus. Mary said it. Martha said it. The Jews that stood by said it. If you'd have been here, he wouldn't be dead. We got faith to believe that you are a physician. But to us, the resurrection is an event. How do you know that? Because of what the sister said. She said, we know that he shall be raised at the last day. That's what she said. Martha said unto him, verse 24, I know that, we, that he shall rise again in the, res, in the resurrection at the last day. To her, the resurrection was an event. And Jesus said in verse 25, I am the resurrection. The resurrection is not an event, it's a person. Make good use of it. Don't aim too low. Cry out to God for things of majesty and glory. Have faith in God. Seek Him on His level. Oh, my soul. John 13. Verse 33. Little children, yet a little while I am with you. You shall seek me, and as I said unto the Jews, whither I go, ye cannot come. So now I say unto you. Verse 36. Simon Peter saith unto him, Lord, whither goest thou? Jesus answered him, Whither I go, thou canst not follow me now, but thou shalt follow me afterwards. Where is he going? Isaiah 63. Verse 10. He's going to do that which the disciples could not believe, they could not perceive. It did not register in their minds. He actually says to them, and we'll see it in a minute, I'm, I'm, I have told you, you know where I'm going because I've told you. They just couldn't believe it. Isaiah 63, verse 3. I have trodden the winepress alone. That's where I'm going. No other creature can go there. Angels do not qualify. Men are falling into trespass and sin. They are not qualified. I am the only God-man. I am the Lamb of God, perfect in all my ways. I have to tread the winepress alone. And of the people, there was none with me. Verse 5, Isaiah 63. And I looked, and there was none to help. And I wondered that there was none to uphold. Therefore, mine own arm brought salvation unto me, and my fury it upheld me and he tells the disciples on the road to Emmaus in Luke chapter 24 verse number 21 we trusted that it had been he that should have redeemed Israel listen and beside this they said today is the third day they knew everything but they didn't believe in him since these things were done. Yea, and certain women also of our company. The time is right. It's the third day. The witness has been set forth. Certain women also of our company made us astonished, which were early at the sepulcher. And when they found not his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels, which said that he was alive. They had the women to tell them. They had the angels to tell them. They had the proper day. It was the third day. And certain of them which were with us went to the sepulcher and found it even so as the women had said. But him they saw not. 
Guess what the next word is? Then. That's when it changes from David and his men to David and the people. Once they had seen Ziklag burn with fire and the women and children taken, it changes from David and his men to David and the people because these men of his turned on him. Dear soul, the devil has often tried to force it upon me and therefore I know there has no temptation taken me but such as is common to every man. So I know you've had to deal with it too. That maybe we were some kind of special little Sunday school Christians. Maybe some, maybe I should say some little special Sunday school sinners. We weren't really bad sinners. We, we were sinners, but no, friend. We might have thought we was groupies with Jesus, David and his men. But we turned out to be the people that spake of stoning him. We turned out to be the sisters of the brother who was dead that he had told us. If you would believe me, you shall see not Lazarus arise, but the glory of God. Didn't we sit around your coffee table on many a Saturday morning? Well, that would have been their Sabbath race there. On many an early morning and drink coffee and have whatever and talk about things concerning these matters. Did you not hear? Did you not listen? Dear soul, we need to admit it that we are all such sinners as it took the life of God to be sacrificed because of the depth of our sin. I wasn't no little Sunday school sinner. You can't go back in my life and find blatant immoralities. But you know what? You can go back and find blatant moralities wherein I thought I was all right with God. Because I walked with Jesus. I had a Bible. My mother gave me a Bible. But then... Evidently, my offense was so that God finally showed me and said, Boy, I've had enough of this. And I'm going to show you the difference of what you think you are and what you really are. And then I became David and the people. Then he said unto them, and listen to this. Now he'd been having fellowship with them. He'd been walking up the road with them. They'd been pouring out their hearts to him. They told him about the angels. They told him about the women. They told him about the third day. They pouring out their hearts concerning things that had to do with him. But listen what he says to him in verse 25. Then he said unto them, O fools, give me a biblical definition of a fool. Fool has said in his heart, and he called them fools. No, he called us fools. We had a figment of our imagination, but we did not know who Jesus really was till we came to know who we really were. Abject, God hating, sin loving. Sinners, without God and without Christ, in this world, no more concern about our condition because we were convinced that we were pretty good old boys or girls. Then he said unto them, O fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? Don't you understand? I'm going there by myself. I'm going to tread the wine press alone. There's none that's going to be able to help me. And the reason is that the prophets have told you all of this all along. 
that the Lamb of God is going to have to suffer on the cross because of sin. And only then can he enter into his glory. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And guess what it did to them? Did not our heart, verse 32, burn within us while he talked with us by the way? When's the last time you had spiritual heart burn? When's the last time that I had an awareness of the fiery judgment of my soul falling upon me from the very mouth and the witness of Jesus Christ himself, who himself, you can't fool him, he stood in your place. Whatever sin you are, uh, are forgiven of, he took it on himself. He was made to be sin for us. He was made in the likeness of sinful flesh. He knows my sin. He suffered for it. And arguing back and forth about how many hairs in that horse's tail in the book of the Revelation and making sure we dot every eye and cross every T. He said, fools and slow of heart to believe that the prophets have said, get back to the reality of this thing. God is going to have to die. Stress is upon me. My sweat is going to be as great drops of blood. Mm. That's the way it's going to be. John 14. Verse 2b, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And whither I go, ye know, and the way you know. And Thomas said, no, we don't. Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Matthew 16 you would do well to jot this verse down beside John 14, 4, Matthew 16, 21. Matthew chapter 16. Verse 21. From that time forth, Jesus began, began Jesus to show unto his disciples how he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders, of the chief priests and scribes, and be killed and be raised again the third day. How did it affect Peter? Peter pulls him aside and said, You're out of your mind. These things can't happen to you. Be it far from thee, Lord. This shall not be unto thee. Jesus said, I'm going where you cannot go. I'm going to have to suffer greatly as David was greatly distressed. So the Lord Jesus Christ was greatly distressed and it was as if we blamed him for the mess we were in and therefore we nullified his need of a ignominious death. You're going to what? I'm going to suffer at the hands of the Gentiles, be killed. They're going to strip me naked. They're going to spit on me. I didn't write down all the verses that take us too long, but you can cross-reference that verse right there and find out where Jesus told him specifically exactly the things that were going to happen to him. But they just didn't want to believe it. So he says, whether I go, you know. Thomas said, no, we don't. Well, you must have been asleep in class because I did tell you. Now, in 1 Samuel chapter 30, 
It said, And David was greatly distressed. Achish is not there. Jonathan, his friend, is not there. His parents, his family are not there. Abigail, that beautiful wife, back in chapter 25, can you can read her glorious words to encourage his heart. She's not there. His family's gone. His sons and daughters are gone. And all he's got are his men that have now become the people. And it says they spake of stoning him. In Exodus 17, 4, the people were ready to stone Moses concerning water. Here in 1 Samuel chapter 30 and verse number 6, the people are ready to stone David because of their wives. Then in John chapter 8 and verse 59 and John 10 and 31, the people were ready to stone Jesus concerning worship. It seems like that that which the people have a desire for greatly, water with Moses, wives with David, and worship with Christ, that they will turn on you and they will reveal their true depraved nature as sinners. They may have previously been your friends. They may have sat down and ate with you where you ate out in the wilderness being driven around by Saul. They may have had to put up with Philistines on your account. But when it comes to whatever the issue is, and God crosses them at the point of their rebellion, they turn on their leader. And three different leaders, Moses and David and Christ, were spoken of as almost being stoned by the people. Dear soul, this may not be comfortable hearing this, but isn't it better to hear this and realize what a wretched sinner I am? Because that makes me understand and know that I need a great Savior. Amen. If you ain't much of a sinner, you, gotta, you can do well with a two for a nickel Jesus. But the man after God's own heart bespeaks of the one who has God's heart. And we turned on him. In the hour, oh, my soul, when the greatness of his glory was just about to be revealed, but not until the magnitude of our depravity was brought forth. It says in verse 6 of First Samuel 30, And David was greatly distressed. And there's two words we need to notice. For and because. Why was great David greatly distressed? For the people spake of stoning him. Would that have got their wives back? No, they just lost another companion. What's the next word? Because. Why did the people spake of stoning of David? Because the soul of the people was grieved. They were grieved and it put David in great distress. They were grieved every man for his sons and for his daughters. And that threw the leader into that which only a leader like David and Christ can do. He encouraged himself in the Lord, his God. Romans chapter 5 
and verse number 8. Romans chapter 5 and verse number 8. Verse 7, for scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die, but God commanded his love towards us. What kind of love is it? It's a love in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. No need to look among the disciples to see if there's anybody worthy for him to die. They all went to their own place. They all went home and shut the door and locked it from the inside. Among his disciples was the betrayer and the denier. He tread the wine press alone. When there was no one else to help him, he said, I did it by my own right arm. Just so you need to get in this. The thing that got the people aggravated with Jesus was, has, was a matter of worship. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Whatever you have known the Father to be, that's who I am. And he, he desired and deserves their worship. Verse 10, Romans chapter 5. For if when we were, do you want to say it? Do you want to own it? For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Mm. While we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Much more, being now reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. You can be assured, dear soul, that God is going to maintain your salvation by his daily life. Colossians chapter 1, verse 21. And you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death, to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. His body was mangled, mutilated. Spear in his side, thorns on his head, nails driven through his feet and hands so that you might be pure. Isn't that good? Do you love him? You can't love him uh, uh, as much until you realize what he did for you and you can't realize what he did for you till we realize who we were when he did it. First right. Corinthians chapter 6. First Corinthians chapter 6 verse number 9. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor abusers of themselves with, kind, with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners, shall inherit the kingdom of God. Can you read me down to the snake eyes in verse 11? Were you? 
I was. Let me help you out. After the snake eyes, read me down to the next comma. Don't you like that? What were you washed with? It wasn't Grandma's lye soap. And it's the best soap in the land. You were washed in a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. That's where us sinners were plunged beneath that flood. And we lost all. all. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. And God shall have you presented to him by the Lord Jesus Christ in the presence of all the holy angels and stand in the presence of the fiery eyes of God looking at you and he shall find you according to Jude faultless. The old jeweler puts a little eyepiece in his eye and pulls the light down and takes the diamond on the little stick that he has and searches it, turns it, and he can't find any fault in it anywhere. You couldn't, you didn't need to have an eyepiece or a brighter light to find a fault in me. You could see it from a mile away. Self-centered, pride-filled, egotistical, liar when I had to. Without God, without hope. But Jesus came. And while I was yet sinner, a sinner, Christ died for me. I had been baptized and was lying to God and myself in the church for seven years. I was a nice little moral boy, and that was worst sin of all trying to force God to accept justification by works. And God said, you're about gone as far as I can stand. You're a stench in my nostrils. And he brought me to the foot of the cross and made me see two things, who I was and who Jesus was. And I've been trying to tell about it ever since. And such were some of you, but ye are washed, not only that, but ye are sanctified, continually set apart for God's specific use. But ye are justified. Wow. Isn't that good? In the name of the Lord Jesus, and by the Spirit of our God. Isn't that good? And he said to her, go and sin no more. Hebrews chapter 2. David's men came to be known as the people. Hebrews 2.14 for as much then as the children were partakers of flesh and blood. He also him likewise, himself likewise took part of the same. That through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. And that he might deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For of a truth, for verily he took not on him took not hold of the fallen angels to, for their redemption, but he took hold on, uh, uh, of the seed of Abraham. Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful, full of mercy and faithful, full of faith, high priest 
in things pertaining to God. Why? Finish out verse 17. In things pertaining to God. Out of the ivory palaces into a world of woe. Only that great, glorious, precious love of God made my Savior go. You and I cannot imagine the glory of Jesus Christ, the eternal Son with the Father, filled with the Holy Spirit completely in the eternals. And in the basking in the glory of the Father's love as revealed in Proverbs chapter 8. And then God said, it's time to go. Look yonder. There's some men. It's going to be. Greatly distressed because the devil has stolen their bride in order that they may see how God feels when his bride is taken in sin. Look yonder, there lays a friend dead and stinking and his two sisters. Even if you offer them a sight of the glory of God, they're going to rebuke you and say you should have prevented this, not cure it. Because didn't Benjamin Franklin say that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure? Mm -hmm. Isn't that logical? Uh-huh. But God didn't come to be logical. He came to be, can you handle this word? Magnanimous. Let me give you another one. It's just me. He came to be stupendous. He came to manifest the glory of God among sinners. He came and he didn't look at what they did. He looked at who they were. Well, he killed my dog. I'm going to go get my gun. I'm going to kill his cat. That's what sinners do is kill your dog. He didn't come to look at my fault. He came and looked at my needs. Oh, what a glorious Savior. It's time to go. And he left the eternal glory and presence and good of his father and came down to where we were. And the Bible says he was made in the likeness of sinful flesh. And the most horrifying thing that I could ever hear in my soul and in my heart and mind is to hear my precious Savior Say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? It should have been Gene Breen. You should have forsaken him. He did it. And to know that my sin separated the eternal Son of God from the Father and dear soul, the description of death is separation. You separate the soul from the body, death. To separate Jesus Christ from the Father, death. Let me ask you something. Jesus said, no man taketh my life. I have the power to lay it down. I have power to take it up again. This, this was I given of my Father. The Father can't even make him do it. God gave Jesus Christ the right and the privilege and the ability to die when he wanted to. And he said he could take it back up again. And nobody could take it away from him. So what made him die? 
Well, it was that devil. No, that's the easy way out. Well, it was them Jews. You ain't close enough yet. Me. Dare you say it about yourself? Am I by myself? Am I the only one in here who believes he's a sinner that made Jesus Christ separate himself from God? He was made in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. David and his men became David and the people. Oh, my soul. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your goodness to us. Luke chapter 19. Verse 37. Luke 19, 37. And when he was come nigh, even now at the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed be the King that cometh in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Just having a big time. Verse 41, and when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it. Now, you see, I have a problem with this because I see myself with this bunch. Hosanna, glory to God in the highest. But you understand, it's my Savior weeping over me in that city doing that because he says father he ain't got a lick of sense he don't know he don't know from nothing and I sometimes think that maybe times of my praise that was from inordinate affection was some of my highest sin they were praising God and blessing the Lord and Jesus wept. In verse 47, listen to him. You can't beat him. Listen to him. And he taught daily in the temple. Which temple? The temple in Jerusalem. You mean the city... That he wept over in verse 41, yep. While they didn't have an idea what they were doing, were jumping up and down and hollering, carrying on in verses 37 and 38, yep. And then what did he do later? He taught daily in the temple, and all the time, the chief priests and the scribes and the chief of the people sought to do what? I wonder if... I really knew my heart, and I wonder if I could really see myself as God sees me, would I be so flippant about Christianity? And it makes me thankful for the Lord Jesus Christ that he shall present us faultless before the throne of Almighty God. Because it was him that was greatly distressed among the people.